Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope you're all doing well out there. I'm recording this from sunny Luxor in uh, Upper Egypt. At the moment, I'm right at the end of a really long visit to Egypt. I've been here for several weeks now. Uh, looking forward to getting back home, making some more content. But I've got something a little different for you all today. Not like my regular produced content. This is actually a walkthrough of the incredible Assyrian, the subterranean structure that's found at the back of the temple of Seti I at Abydos, which is also here in Upper Egypt. I really wanted to do a live stream while I was at the site. If you saw, I put out a community post saying I was gonna try and live stream, but unfortunately there really isn't enough cellular bandwidth to be able to do that. I could barely get a single megabit of upload speed out of the phone, so instead I recorded a walkthrough. I really hope you enjoy this. I had a little bit of uh, private time, I guess, in the Assyrian before the rest of the group showed up for our private permission access into the site, have a bit of a chat and some interaction with Yusuf, also Russ and Kyle from the Snake Bros, and then stick around to the end of the video. I've got uh, some interesting new perspectives, I guess, and we got into some spots that gave me some new data, if you like, on the Assyrian, and I'll share those at the end of the walkthrough. I'll also probably drop in and out with a couple of little edits and comments as we go through it. And as always, a massive thank you to all of the channel supporters, patrons, and everybody else who supports my work through that value for value model. I couldn't do this without your help and support. And if you're interested in that, please do check out my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. I hope you enjoy the walkthrough and I'll catch you in the next one. All right, try this again. Here we are at the Assyrian in Abydos, Upper Egypt. I would have loved to live stream here, I tried. Uh, the bandwidth is just too bad. Too poor, not enough to live stream, but I'm gonna try and record this. I did this once already, my phone overheated, so I took it out of its case, and we'll see what happens, but... Yeah, so this is at the back. You find this at the back of the Temple of Seti I, which is this structure up here. You can see it's me, I'll flip the phone in real quick. Hello, here at the Assyrian. And, uh, yeah, remarkable structure that was most likely discovered during the time of construction of the temple. And it's an entirely different style and at an entirely different level to the architecture that we find in the temple of Seti I, who was the ruler of the 19th dynasty. And uh, obviously his son, Ramses II, and then Mer his son, Mer and Patar have their names throughout the temple. Also in parts of this structure, actually. Although not Ramses II, funnily enough, the Seti I is named in here and then Mer and Patar also at some point got in here and did this, but there are two accesses into the Assyrian. One is all the way around the back. You walk past the remediation wells, although these, you see these wells here are also part of the system used to pump the water out. There are more wells over this hill. So you walk all the way around and then you can access this via this long sloping tunnel. You see the roof of it just here. I'm looking at my screen. I'm aiming with my eye and I should be looking through the screen. And this is all made probably, this may well have been dynastic uh, when it was created. It's, it's full of engravings and hieroglyphs. And it was Flinders Petrie and his associate, his wife and his associate actually, that, that really first uncovered this and started to excavate. And they excavated it right down to pretty much the, the end part of it here. And they documented everything that happened. And then they couldn't get any further. In fact, this, this circular tunnel here that's... Um, this like brick construction that you can see, maybe I'll zoom in on it. This stuff here is, uh, is, a, is a relatively modern construction, at least in these days it's 100, 150 years old, but this was done by, I think Petrie, if not Professor Edward Neville, who was the real guy who, who, who actually really excavated this entire structure in, the, in and around 1914 was when he finished, but he, he had been working uh, in years prior to that here in the Assyrian as well. And he talked about it, you know, they didn't know where they were going. They, they had this, as there was this huge lump of debris and rubble because Petrie, when he was excavating the temple, had dumped everything out on top of, uh, on top of this area. So you can imagine all of this was covered in dirt and then sand and all the rubble and the excavations from the temple were dumped on here. So they had to move all of that out the way as they were getting in under here and then they had the idea, all right, they need to clear it down from the top and start to get into it because they did, there were some open chambers and passages. There are some like the ceiling box here and uh, they kept seeing what they thought were doorways, but it was just really gaps between the columns. 
that they got into and they were crawling in this space and eventually they he uh, removed all of the sand out of here and revealed it and Neville in his paper called it the great pool and the tomb of Osiris so it's it's just monstrous construction I mean there's these huge cyclopean granite blocks that make up the structure of the central island and the of the Assyrian and also the, the the floor blocks are all granite and then it's lined in these in these quartzite blocks and then behind that is limestone fairly roughly worked you can see the limestone over there and then there's the quartzite blocks on the walls and then you have these all these granite pillars and blocks and beams that are everywhere else obviously a lot of this is now modern reconstruction or modern retaining walls and in fact you can see up here this cement wall there's this huge 10 or 15 meter cement wall that's been sunk down as a retaining wall to stop sort of the hill from coming this way uh, into the Assyrian. But quite clearly not part of the uh, temple construction. I think it's highly likely that when this temple was being made, they had to dogleg it to the left in order to avoid the Assyrian when they probably discovered it. And even Edward Neville in his, in his writings about the Assyrian suggested that it might be the oldest building in Egypt altogether, which is kind of hard to imagine given that if this is the first try at making a building, it's quite, it's quite spectacular, but he definitely dates it as being, well, it matches the uh, stonework and the masonry that you see in places like the Sphinx Temple or the Valley Temple, although it's much larger, like the actual, the actual granite blocks here are bigger uh, than what you see in those places. And he dates it as being you know, potentially Old Kingdom, or he, he even says, even in 1914, that it may well be pre-dynastic. But this entire structure is actually an island. You can, you can see here this granite, there's water that runs all the way around the edge of it. The ceiling spans the gap, but there's, it's actually built on top of an island. The whole thing is built on top of a, a very specific small aquifer or a natural spring that comes from somewhere and it, it pushes up water into here. And uh, it's not Nile water that comes in here, although it may well be connected to the Nile, and we can talk about that too. He, Strabo, and so Strabo is another guy who, who, who talked about this particular space, or we think he was talking about this space. And he, he describes it as having a canal that also connected it to the Nile. So I've removed the magical rope barrier here. And you can see the water level's a lot lower than it has been in the past. They've been actively pumping the water out here. They've been doing a lot of work removing all the big blocks that used to be in these channels and they've shifted them out the back. So they're cleaning this up and I've been talking with the guy who is responsible for all the excavation work happening here now and they say they have plans to remove all of the mud. So this, you can see the sediment level, but they want to pump all of that out. And obviously there's, you can see the granite blocks that are still uh, stuck in the, uh, in the channels everywhere. These are all remnants from quarrying and later activities but even when Neville was here he was here during a particularly dry year so the, the water table had, level had dropped and when they excavated down they got down about four meters below the level of the uh, the platform and you could see you know he could he could you could see it down there's actually old photographs from uh, from that period and that excavation and he estimated that it might have been another four meters beyond that so eight meters, but we know now <clears throat> from more modern explorations that it's actually much deeper than that. Five or six stories, 30 meters plus. We don't really know because every time people have tried to probe the bottom and get through the muck and find out where, you know, where does this go, you end up hitting water pressure that's being pushed up from this aquifer and it really messes with these stick readings. That, and there's all these different readings for how deep the water actually goes here. We're not quite sure. Future Ben here, after I recorded this walkthrough, I was chatting with the lead archaeologist who's been doing all of the work in the Assyrian and pulling out all of the blocks and doing some more recent excavations. And I asked him about the depth of the Assyrian, and he told me 21 meters was the depth. So in lieu of any other past experiments or all the other reports that I've seen, I'm just going to go with his figure for 21 meters, which is really quite a remarkable depth when you consider that entire island is constructed of granite blocks and you know hopefully when they do remove all of the mud and the water we'll actually be able to get down there and see all of these constructed blocks and maybe find out if there are chambers or if there's anything else below the surface so hopefully in the future 
in the not too distant future they'll clear this out and we'll actually get to the bottom of this but this is constructed so the entire island you're standing on top of a huge megalithic construction here like these are all blocks and in the pictures we have and from what we know there are constructed blocks that go down much much further and if it's anything like the construction work on top i mean these are cyclopean massive granite blocks that have likely come from aswan you know, this, this quartzite on the walls here has probably come from the, the Cairo region, the Red Mountain to the north of Cairo. So this stuff's come in from a long way away. And it's just immense. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to say until you're actually in here. Um, of course, it's been quarried. So you see a lot of the damage. You see the typical kind of wedge and chisel quarrying marks, say, on the top of this block here. We zoom in. You can see it up there. Uh, you can see more of them just here on this block. Over here, they tried to take a face off of this, this stone and they, they, it didn't split evenly. It just took the chunk off it, off the top. And Neville thinks that the excavation work was probably not particularly ancient. It might've even been the Coptic. So after the Romans uh, and the Persians even, so it might've been Coptic Christian uh, era quarrying. So the, the, this, the, uh, the site might've been uncovered even as recently as then and was potentially even whole and it was used as a quarry, a convenient granite quarry uh, for stones down here. There's a lot of detail in this, in this, in this site. Obviously it was occupied and, and, and other times, I mean, you know, this is a good spot to zoom in on this as well. The, uh, the flower of life, hopefully you can see it. It's very bright and I can barely see my phone screen. I was trying to live stream uh, this chat, but the bandwidth is just like less than a megabit of upload, which just wouldn't make anyone very happy because it'd be very pixelated. But you have these flowers of life that are in here. Of course, it's quite famous for the flowers of life, although I think there's something of a distraction from the actual achievement that they're, that they're etched onto or that they're painted onto. Kind of looks like paint to me. There's also a, a depiction of a boat that may be, may be a Greek boat or something that's in here. So other people have clearly been down here, as I think the dynastic Egyptians were because you have Seti I and Meren Ptah uh, who wrote their names all over it. Well, they wrote their names in that passageway that we'll go take a look at. They also wrote their name on some glyphs at the back of the Assyrian, but the vast majority of it is completely unadorned with no glyphs whatsoever. And, and in that, it matches much of the, you know, the so-called old kingdom architecture, things like the Valley Temple, the Sphinx Temple, where there's just no glyphs anywhere. It's just simple, massive, and speaks on its own. You can see the quarry of these things. So not all of these pillars are single block. You have multiple blocks here. This one around the corner here is multiple blocks. But most of them are these massive single pillars. You can see how they're kind of keyed in as well. Like they had either keystones or they were they were like notched in to, uh, to, to fit. You can see another gap where there might have been another keystone here. But since the water's been pumped out of here, you actually, there's a tremendous amount of detail that's being revealed with the lower water levels, it's certainly lower than I've ever seen it in the past. And one of the really cool um, things about it is, I'll talk about what this is in a minute, but one of the really cool things here is the, uh, the tube drill that goes off into the um, granite masonry here. So you have a, basically a tubular drill that's worn, that runs off this way. And then there's always been a bit of mystery about where this goes, but again, speaking with the people doing the excavation here, they say they figured this out. And they say it actually goes out to about here, and then it dog legs and turns down, and goes down at an angle, and it pops out over in the channel over there. Future Ben here again. I just want to talk a little bit more about this tube drill. Because again, and there is something of a, a language barrier when it comes to speaking with the, uh, the Egyptian team doing the work here. I kind of clarified what he had told me previously about that tube drill. I'd actually learned that information last year uh, when I was at the site. And this footage you can see right now is has is been kindly provided by Carolee, one of the people on this tour, who had a good look inside the hole. You can see it either stops at the end or it's blocked or maybe it does turn the corner. But the archaeologist told me that he they weren't actually quite sure where it came out. That was kind of a guess uh, where it might have came out down lower on those uh i guess in the canals around the central island and he also thinks this, that there are probably other tube drill inlets or there are probably other tube drills down there but it, again it's just kind of his postulation and his idea they don't actually know for sure hello yeah. 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 
There's the man. There they all are. Welcome to the Assyrian. What's <laughs> up, bro? There is not. There's definitely not enough uh, bandwidth for streaming. I'm just recording. Yeah, yeah. But I'm gonna upload it as a live stream. <laughs> yeah, man. There's my buddy Tito. There he is. <laughs> Tito. See, so yeah, I got a little bit of a head start on the group and got in here. Wanted to chat to YouTube about it. But um, so this this uh, inset is actually really interesting because it's, I don't know if you can see, but there's in, it's inset slightly. Like it's like this inset that runs around the edge of this. I'll even zoom out a bit more. Runs around the edge of this whole pillar base and you'll find the same thing on these other pillars. So if we look at the base of this pillar, you see it's inset, right? It's inset in, so I think this was likely a pillar base. And you, you probably had the pillar resting maybe on the edges of this granite block, these granite blocks, and then there's a space beneath it. Like this is stone floor. I don't know if it was sunk all the way in, if it was actually keyed in here, or if it was just sitting on this edge. And you had a space here, but you also have this tube drill that somehow, it's gotta be there for a reason, right? You have to have planned this as part of the masonry and you're building it kind of like the shafts and the pyramid to do something, maybe push water, or I don't know, but you can see the old water lines and level where the water used to be. And you could just see it. You couldn't get in here because it was mud and wet, but they cleared it out. And uh, yeah, it's a real mystery as to what that is. And are there tube drills behind or beneath these other pillars? We, we just don't know. Future Ben here again. After I finished the walkthrough, we did kind of get a little bit closer to the bottom of this question about whether or not these pillars are keyed directly into those sockets. And I mean, just from a logical perspective, I think they were because if you consider these pillars were likely supporting these the huge ceiling that we see in the Assyrian, I mean, that's a lot of weight sitting on these granite pillars and you'd think that they would need to be keyed in all the way down in those sockets to support just that massive weight that's sitting on top of them. But if you look closely at this image where I've frozen it, take a look at this hole. This is like a new little hole that's been dug. I, I didn't see this even a month ago when I was here. And it seems to like somebody's just dug in beneath one of the pillars there and it's got a bunch of dirt in there or whatever and we, we stuck our hand in and kind of cleared it out as best we could. You do run into stone. So if that's a socket beneath that pillar, then the pillar seems to extend down into it. Now, I couldn't really tell if there was a gap uh, between the socket and the pillar itself. But if it is socketed into that space, it really begs the question, then what is that tube drill for in the socket? Uh, even Edward Neville speculated in 1914 that he thinks it might be some, some sort of hydraulic installation, the whole, the whole site. He doesn't think it's ceremonial or anything like that. He actually speculated it might have been functional. And again, talking with the lead archaeologist about that tube drill, he thinks that it was also functional. He thinks it might have had something potentially to do with compressing water or somehow maintaining the water level uh, in the overall Assyrian. We we really don't know, and it's kind of an open question as to whether or not, you know, there are more of these tube drills beneath the pillars, or if this is just a, a single occurrence that happens at the one of the central pillar sockets on the island. You can see this here is actually a larger space, a much larger space. Potentially it was also the base for another another pillar, but one thing we observed the last trip here is actually what might be the largest block that's in here. And it's actually this one. So if you look at the, the dimensions of this granite block, right, it runs up to here. It dog legs around this corner, comes here, runs all the way down here. And then this, we don't know how deep it is because the water's there, but it, it actually includes this whole cutout section here for this piece. It runs over here. We're still on the same block. It runs all the way to here. And then <laughs> dog legs back around underneath this pillar. This looks like to me, this might be a potentially a modern repair under there. I don't really know. And then up here and under here. So if I back up and look at it, it's huge, just huge. This one piece here, like, like all the way there back around here. Massive. 
Of course, the deepest parts in this are also, that we know of at least, are in the end pools. And again, they've, you can see some of the steps that go down. But, you know, it goes down a long way. There's a rod there shoved into it, but... I mean, this water's pretty gnarly. I've heard about people drinking it and their eyesight improved and whatever, but I'm, uh, I'm not, my eyesight's fine and I don't want to take the risk. <laughs> so on the back wall here, and this is quartzite, you can see it is inscribed. So, but you can see also, if you look closely, it's hammered in. Like this is, you can see the headdress there. I mean, this is obviously the works of hammer and chisel work. Uh, it's fairly rough relative to the hard surface. You also have some inscriptions on the top level of granite here. Right, so it's not like it's entirely unadorned. Structure was still intact. Yeah. When they were here. I mean, look at this uh, beautiful straight lines on this. The bottom of these. Uh... <laughs> look at that. Oh god. This. It could be better. Someone can draw a straight line. And it does definitely seem like at least Seti the first got in here and uh, left his mark. And then strangely, Ramsey's never came in here. And what we think might've happened is, is said he might've actually sealed this up. And then Ramsey's never got in here, but then Meron Patar, who, you know, some say he was trying to be close to Osiris all the time. And given this was considered the tomb of Osiris or a sanctuary of Osiris or the tomb of Osiris's head or something, then he might've got in here and added his name. Cause in these, these passages back here, if you look right back in there, you can see there's inscriptions and we'll go and look at all of that wall as well and in the meantime we'll film the rest of the group coming down i think they're walking around are they are they walking around are they walking around the other groups walking around all right cool we'll go and meet them in a minute but yeah it's just i mean i don't know what to tell you about this other than it's super impressive and then of course you have this area which is the finished ceiling block like that you still have the the finished massive granite ceiling that's on here these huge spans of granite that cross over there were even bigger beams in here at one point and i'll show you those in a minute and of course in these, some of these little alcoves and in these little indentations and on top of some of the blocks there are keystones and they found keystones and some of those keystones have had like the cartouche of uh seti the first on them like these locking keystones that sit on top of some of the blocks. And I, I've heard people say, well, that's proof that he built it, but it's, I don't think it's any more proof that he built it any more than the hieroglyphs are proof that he built it. The hieroglyphs could have been added later, the keystones could have been added later, the glyphs on the keystones could have been added later. It doesn't match anything else uh, that's around here and certainly not the architecture that was in, you know, being used by guys like Seti I and the 19th dynasty, as powerful as they were. The other great feature that you see in here is this unfinished smoothing of the wall. All right, so they were smoothing from the top down, almost like they had a, some sort of paint roller or something. And, you know, they, they slowly put down their tools at some point for some reason and stop smoothing. You also see plenty of nubs. Oh, that's a cool spot. How'd you get up there? When did you get up there? That's cool. That's a cool perspective. Oh, there's Russ. Also, these nubs, you see tons of other little details in these stones, the little inset keystones. So maybe there was damage to a stone or somebody knocked a corner off, but you find, I mean, everything's notched in. And, uh, you know, even here, like stuff is notched in. So it's not like simple, just layers of masonry. They, they went to extreme effort to like make this a, a tightly fit, precision megalithic wall. And I know it's somewhere around here there are insets with just the tiniest little piece that's been added. And maybe it's because somebody chipped a corner off or something happened, but this also shows you that these blocks were transported here unfinished and then they were finished in place, right? So it's, we see this commonly with, with other architecture. Uh, stuff was, was shipped with, Merin, like the Menkara pyramid, the third pyramid, it was, it was fitted with this, you know, this puffy, layer of stone that was then removed. It's potentially a protective layer of stone for transport. And then it was, uh, it was removed. Also, you can see all of the alcoves, the cells, alcoves, whatever you want to call them, about six feet wide or seven feet wide and tall. Uh, insets, they have tube drills uh, in the holes there. 
but uh, or in the tops, so they had doors. Uh, and these are these kind of matching on this side and then on the other side where you've had a lot more destruction, you, you also have these little alcoves or cells uh, in place. There's also a very impressive stone here, this, this lentil, this quartzite lentil that sits above the back door. This is a huge block of very fine quality quartzite. And again, the lower water level is revealing a lot of details. You can see the lines from where the water level was, but we see these large nubs uh, on these granite blocks that make up the floor. And then of course, the stairs that seem to lead down into the pool. And again, without these bridges here, you would, you, you can notice that it's actually a, you know, it's, it's an island. Like you're literally looking at, even zoom out a bit further. This is an, this whole thing's an island built on top of an aquifer that's five or six stories tall, <laughs> made from granite. And we have no idea if there are chambers in it or anything like that. We just don't know. And, you know, I really am hopeful that they get to a point where they're getting all of this sediment out of here and this mud and pumping it out with a muck pump or something. It's another nice nub on the stone here. So yeah, let me have a look. Let's see. So we go up here and this is, uh, this is where they've been storing all of the uh, bits and pieces of granite that they've found from, from, uh, from various spots. And you can see the the, the shape of the of the roof beam. Did you get up there? That's cool. Did you I see did, something? Yeah, I was wanting to look at the tops of the ceiling, and uh, uh, apparently they found a black keystone. Keystone, yeah. Yeah, with Seti the first yeah, inscription. So it's not in there, but there are some black keystones. I've seen there. a picture. The guy has a picture of it. The main archaeologist has a picture of it. Yeah. But yeah, the blocks, the ceiling blocks, from you know, in person. <laughs> Mass. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 It is cool. And you can see the thickness of the wall all the way. Like you've got the, the hard sandstone or quartzite and then it goes back, you know, six meters. Yeah, wasn't it 20 feet was the thickness yeah. of the walls? That's what, yeah. what is it, Neville? Professor Neville, Edward Neville yes. said, yeah. yeah. And this stuff used to be, I can tell you from previous visits, I probably got footage of it, but this all used to be just all over here and there was reeds and shit in here. Yeah. They've been doing a lot of work. And they've, they've, they really cleaned it up and they're working on it. And you can see actually even the floors constructed in here pretty well. What is this, limestone it almost looks like? I'm not sure. These are all quarried bits of granite that came out of the, the passages and tunnels. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah? Yeah, it's just cool. So these are the, the span blocks, right? The, these arch blocks and then there would have been another span on top yes. of granite. So this would have been a chamber just like the one on the other side. Yeah. Which is intact. Yeah, this is like the other chamber with yeah. the, the triangular ceiling, yeah, right? Had a, an, a vaulted ceiling. Yeah. And there's this just monstrous block of quartzite here as well. That's the lentil. I like the colors in this thing. It's like... Yeah, Neville said that was a 12-foot block. 12-foot block. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then this side, they've obviously stacked up a bunch more stuff. There they are. This is up Petrie's constructed tunnel. There's Carl. And there's all of the inscriptions on the passage. We'll go in there and have a look a bit later. Illegal. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Alright, I'll try and do this without banging the phone. Yeah. I got it, I got it, thanks. Yeah, so this, yeah, we're standing on a massive block here. So this block here with the key dent runs all the way to here. And this is a big granite block right here. You can see the coloring. Pink granite. Oh yeah. Hey man. How are you? Good, how are you doing? <laughs> well this is a giant, as I point out, this is a massive granite block here that I'm standing on, right? Russ just showed it to me. But it starts here. 
So I'm standing on the tip of it and it runs all the way. Like yeah, it's one of the ceiling pieces and it has a notch. Yeah. It was probably notched in. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, a keystone or something was in here. Somebody was making a huge yeah. stone right here. Yeah, column base maybe? And this was about as far as Petrie got too. Like this, this is all, this is an ancient modern, <laughs> a modern ancient construction. This brickwork was done 100, 150 years ago for this tunnel. Yes. So Petrie and his wife and his assistant, Marie, or something. Marie, yeah, I forget her name, but his wife was Marie, a, was. was a geologist as well. But they, they excavated that tunnel. You guys just came through and they documented the glyphs and everything. And then it was Edward Neville that finally, he sort of stopped here and then Edward Neville finally got into here and started to see what, what the hell is this. And he sort of saw this one, this giant quartzite block first. And they realized they're onto something big here and this doorway, and this is all filled with sand and Petrie had piled up all of the rubble from the temple excavation on top of this area. So you got to imagine it's all filled up with sand and then there's piles and piles of rubble and sand that came from the temple excavation. So they had to remove all of that first before they even start to come down and, and dig down. It took him years. He came back in a couple of different periods, but at one point they were working here for it was like, like I think it was like seven or eight months with 600 people. They had railway carts, they had two railway lines where they're filling up, uh, just filling up these carts and they're carting it off with, um, you know, with baskets as well. And then of course they get down into this area and it's just pure sand and it just keeps on falling in and they're trying to excavate it out. But he eventually cleared it out and uh, found it. That at that point, it was a dry period in Egypt with the the water table was quite low so he measured about four meters down to where the water was so it's much higher now although it's lower than it's been in a long time about four meters down from where the water was that's where they were the water level was and then he he estimated another four meters below that of constructed masonry but it's actually much deeper than that we know this from more modern experiments of people trying to plumb the bottom right it's like five or six stories 30 meters that form the central island because it's it is effectively an island like it's it's an island built on top of an aquifer and it's all granite construction that you're, you're standing on top of something that's five or six stories tall made from granite that's sitting on top of an aquifer that's pushing this water up and we don't know if there are chambers or anything below it but but they, they i understand they have plans to to actually start pumping the muck and the mud up out of here and so maybe we'll get to the bottom of it eventually like we'll actually figure out how big is this and are there chambers in it and what is it? Because it's the whole thing in the center is granite. And then you're surrounded by quartzite and limestone and sandstone around here. Like this is quartzite. Mm -hmm. It's probably from the Red Mountain, you think? Probably, yeah. Yeah. So when you say they okay. Red, Red Mountains are Cairo. Cairo. Yeah, it's north of Cairo, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, a long way away. So when you say they rail car rubble out of here? Well, on top, you got to imagine that this yeah. is all filled with sand. They had little railway lines with carts that they would. They would pull the cart up. Took it how far away? Yeah, a little bit out in the desert, dump it out, and then they would, they would, these guys would pull it manually. But it was better than using baskets. Yeah, what is the chance that they took the rubble from somewhere and covered up another thing? Somewhere? Probably pretty it's, good. It's not zero, pretty good. But, you know. That's like almost 100% for sure. They dumped it from somewhere. Look here, we can see also here, like uh, three different structures. Four, if we added the modern one with the terraces and this. And then we have the blocks of sandstone here. And yeah. then we have the blocks of limestone here, which is also built by uh, the new kingdom. So this was probably the doing of city the first, and this was the doing of Merim Petah. Seems like what we found here, perhaps, I'm not positive 100%. But for sure, this limestone one came on the ones from Cortezai. And as we can see also the attempt of adding the inscription on the megalithic site. This is another conclusive evidence that the inscriptions can be added by those who inherited the site. And we by mistake used these inscriptions to date and delete and also understand the uh, function of the site based on translating these. Because this is the book of the gates. This is the symbolic tomb of Osiris. Let's go inside and take a look at the so-called symbolic Symbolic too, I'm sorry. Yeah. The foundation itself is built from massive, multi-high blocks. Everything is massive. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ten more scoop marks under here. On the bad it entered the cortisite. So the old construction is built mainly from the cortisite. You still see these blocks are still inset. Let's see if we can do this. Don't die. Don't fall in the mud. See so yeah, these little alcoves. No, I mean these look like they're ground out too. They don't look particularly like tube drilled or anything. But that could have also been functional for a long time. Ceiling's coming in, but this is your typical little alcove that's in here. And there you can see some of the size of the, the ceiling blocks, which are just monstrous. Future Ben here again. I just wanted to point out something that actually Kyle showed me while we were looking around this side of the Assyrian. And that is, take a look here at all of the second level blocks in between the alcoves. All of them along the line here, they're all a single piece. Sometimes the bottom level, you'll have a couple of blocks in there, but all of the second level blocks are a single piece. They have complex geometries. They curve in and around the doorway and then into the alcove and onto the back wall. So these are all very complex carved large single blocks of quartzite also please don't mind my voice in this my i've been losing my voice i typically lose my voice a little bit on these tours i'm not used to talking so much or so loudly while i'm on these trips and uh, you can really hear it in my voice all right i'll show you guys the uh thing at the end here we're going on the ledge See if we can find some interesting stonework bits. So that will join the join, see what Yusuf's got to say a little bit. Then I'm gonna do some explaining for the group. Talk about a few things. Spotted. I see you. <laughs> Obviously the birds like it here. I mean, a lot of this is obviously bird shit. There's just a lot of bird crap in here. Plus there's bats. There are bats in the back chamber. And I just love the reflection of the, uh, the water. You can see it's almost not finished along here too, like. Yeah. And then you put a roof on top of the roof. Yeah, there's layers. The quarried blocks up there. Some of them don't look like that. They remind me so much of the roofing blocks on top of the structures. This could be a bench. Uh, like this rectangular one that is not attached to another block of stone, or these ones were been suspended. Yeah. And we can see the interlocking method. Yeah. Look at this block. Yeah, Yusuf calls it an interlocking method, and he's right. Like in terms of how they the blocks like dig around the corners and dip, and nothing's flat. All right, we'll take a quick look in the back chamber, and then I'm probably going to wrap this up so I can spend some time with my group. And we'll talk a bunch about it. Take a quick look in the chamber and I'll wrap this up. Ah, yeah, we'll take a quick look at the flower of life, hear what Yusuf has to say. These are really powerful, and they are viral everywhere on the internet. About the same like the uh, helicopter or the submarine and all this stuff, <laughs> and stuff like that. 
and they said rumors like it's actually etched with laser into the stone. This is not a, it's it's a painted. Paint. Yeah. And uh, but like, why would they spread this kind of misinformation? And my opinion is to just to take our focus on the symbolism or the flower of life, and not noticing that we are standing in the middle of a megalithic structure that originally had no inscriptions, and we know that these inscriptions came in. It's very important what this site offers. It shows the truth. Shows the truth, indeed. It's on a lower level than the thing all right, so the back chamber, which is much, almost the same as the front chamber, and I'm really pleased to say that they've cleaned this up because they've added this nice, looks like decomposed granite floor that's in here because it used to just stink in here. It was full of bats and bat guano, but it's a big old A-frame ceiling in here. This, you guys, this used to be like, smell really bad in here. There used to be a lot of bat guano. It was a very strong smell. They added this floor in here. It's just awesome. Still Much nicer. Something. No, it better? smells good. I, I like it. Whatever it is, it smells better than it used to. Trust me. <laughs> it doesn't smell bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's, you know, you can see the writing on the... It's all inscribed up in here. On the ceiling. Huge uh, Newt, this is like Newt's, Newt's foot and then Newt, her body runs all the way up to here and there's her head. So Newt's like the, the cosmic ocean, the, the primordial ocean. She represents the stars at night and you can see, yeah, like a primordial goddess. She's being supported by... <laughs> all right guys well i hope you enjoyed this uh well i hope you enjoyed this look into this cereal i'm going to do some more content on this i'm going to do a uh, a proper video and some research stuff and make a a longer produced video with all of the footage that I've collected from around the years, but I really wanted to live stream this today. Just couldn't manage it with the bandwidth, unfortunately, but um, yeah, I've got some plans on uh, content with this thing. So you guys take it easy. Catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. The last aspect of the Assyrian that I wanted to mention in this video has to do with the top of the structure. And I had the uh, chance to get up on top of it kind of on top of the sloping tunnel and then around to the northern side of the Assyrian, which is kind of see it from up on top in the, the viewing area, but it was a rare chance to get up there and actually take a look at it. And this is where they've been doing some recent excavations and they've uncovered some of the keystone blocks that actually lock in all these bow tie joints that sit between the granite blocks. And there are still a couple of keystone blocks in them. These are made from black granite. Uh, you find these types of bow tie joins or keystone blocks in a lot of different structures. Uh, we can find them in places like Karnak at Komombo and also on Luxor Temple. In fact, on some of the large statues at the front of Luxor Temple, there are large holes where there were probably at some point either stone or wooden keystone blocks, I suspect probably stone. Uh, in fact, on the back of one of the statues at Luxor, at the front, you can find keystone blocks still put in place they're kind of almost undersized they're like the wrong fit which makes me think that it's possible that these were a later repair i say this because at the assyrian one of the keystone blocks that they found was inscribed with the cartouche of seti the first and i was shown a photo of this by the archaeologist who's been leading the excavations on the site and he kind of said well this is this must be proof that seti the first built the assyrian uh, I, I don't think this proves it any more than the hieroglyphs prove it. And if you saw that short clip that was in the video, it showed you that, you know, the hieroglyphs are lacking straight lines and all that type of thing, whereas the blocks in the Assyrian seem to have no problem with straight lines. It's clearly a different technology and a different tool set 
being used by the stone carvers making the the inscriptions versus those who were making the blocks themselves. And it's the same thing for the rough cartouche that was on the black granite keystone. It could have been added later. The keystone itself could have been added later as a repair. And this is also reinforced by the fact that behind the Assyrian and in fact on top of these granite blocks were roughly cut limestone blocks. And you can see here all of these limestone blocks. We know that the dynastic Egyptians, particularly those in the 19th dynasty, were working on the Assyrian. Like they, they put their name in, in it. They were, Seti I probably bricked it up and, and restricted access to it. And they may well have built a lot of this limestone infrastructure over the top of it and surrounding it. And they could well have accessed these keystone blocks and either inscribed them or even put these keystone blocks into place because, as we've seen from other examples, they're not exactly super tight fitting. And we know that whoever built the Assyrian could make little inset blocks that are incredibly well fitting. We see it, many, many examples of this in the quartzite walls that make up the Assyrian itself. And in fact, there are a couple of places where there are little inset blocks that just fit perfectly. What we see in the keystone blocks really doesn't match that. While it's interesting, I think it, it really only shows us that, yes, the dynastic Egyptians were working on it. I'm not sure it really proves anything beyond that. So in any case, I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of the Assyrian. Like I said, I do plan to make a more produced research video discussing various aspects of it. And I'm very hopeful that this project that I've heard about to actually remove the muck and the mud from the canals and trenches around that central structure moves forward I, I greatly look forward to seeing any results from it and indeed visiting the site in the future uh, on tours to come which will be a, a, a great time we always make sure that we include the Assyrian as one of the special permissions I think it's a very really important site and it's a real treat to get down in here and look at all of these different aspects of it up close and in person so I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough of the Assyrian and I will see you all in the next video cheers The voice is too hot. Fuck. <laughs> Great. I did all that talk. Oh, how long did it I don't know. I actually have no idea how long it recorded for. <laughs>